The Collected Poems of Sigmund Freud. Sophists have stripped myth from the world like varnish from a rec room wet bar. They've replaced it with existentialism and truistic bumper stickers that, in spite of themselves, are wise. Take it easy, one day at a time. The psychoactive sphere of life is rinsed with iridescence, then vanishes, a soap bubble. A lifetime of survival. Chlorophyll revives sentience somehow, even as photosynthesis fails. Depth once meant the hiddenness of God is intrinsic, unabashed and remote. Nowadays it means dredge it to the surface, integrate it into the circuitry, humming with commonplacement and anxiety. Roger Tory Peterson's Field Guides to the Birds of North America are as mythic as any books of the past century. Their direction is downward, even as the surface seethes with wing beats, the least corrosive animal motion. Though I would trade them for the interpretation of dreams in a heartbeat, this exchange would not constitute a judgment, only an admission of the importance of good maps on the journey to the center of the earth. Only an admission that the bird life of my nighttime evades my binocular eyes. Um, thank you, John, for that introduction and for inviting me to come read here today. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, and it's uh, nice to, s to see all of you people here on a, a Thursday afternoon, chilly afternoon. I'm reading, these are poems from a, a book, uh, my book that was the most recent book of poetry I published, uh, which is called Depth Theology. Um, the title uh, for the book is, in some ways, gives a little bit of context or gives a little sense to the, the poems that I'm reading. Um, you may be aware of the, the, the phrase or the name depth psychology, which is used to refer to you know, any, any psychology that accepts the existence of the unconscious. So it's, it's mostly Freud, Jung, Adler, things like that. The idea that the unconscious is real. You know, it's not some construct, it's not behavioral, it's not some cognitive uh, issue. It's this thing that's real. And you can go to schools where, you can go get a, a degree in, in religious studies or go to a divinity school and you can study people like Freud and Jung precisely because the idea of the unconscious is, while it's not the same thing as, it's, it's, it's similar to what most religions, most Western religions regard as the soul. You know, so, so there's a compatibility. Even though Freud was, he was, he was kind of uh, vigorously anti-religious in his thinking, but you know, he was obsessively, he obsessively wrote about it. So it's kind of like Nietzsche, you know. They, they couldn't, they could never shake it. They couldn't get that monkey off their back, the religion monkey. Um, Jung, obviously, he turned, it into a, he turned psychology into a kind of shamanism, um, which, you know, I kind of dig. I mean, I like that about it. Um, so in any case, that, that phrase, depth psychology, comes from, uh, it was coined by uh, Jung's boss at, at this, ho this hospital in Zurich, outside of Zurich, called the Berghotsli. It's where Jung had his first, uh, his first job, and it was, uh, I mean, it was a classic loony bin. Uh, people with uh, dementia praecox, as they called it at the time, and now we now think of it as schizophrenia. So really severe cases. Jung had a lot of hands-on experience with this, and his boss was this, um, it would be a normal name if, it weren't, if he weren't, uh, you know, Swiss, but his name was Eugen Bleuler. <laughs> Love that. I mean, it's just Eugene, but Eugen, that's how they say it. Eugen Bleuler. And Eugen Bleuler, uh, he, he came up with this, he wanted to talk about the psychology he was interested in, which was looking at these people as these, you know, living forces, 
even though they were disturbed in what we would use as, that would be the way we'd think of them. So they're, they're these living forces, these living realities. So how do, I, how do I acknowledge that they have something deep in them? And he, he coined this phrase, depth psychology. Tifim uh, sociologia. So when I was writing the poems for this book, I was, I was kind of... Uh, I wanted to imagine what a theology of the unconscious would be like. What, what would it be like to accept the idea that there are these parts of the self or the soul that are deep, but that, like the unconscious, we can't know. And they sort of erupt involuntarily into view at times. So that's why, you know, the collected poems of Sigmund Freud, it's supposed to be funny. Good. A little laugh. I like that. Um, when I wrote these poems, I had a, I had a kind of uh, involuntary set of rules that, that emerged. One was that there always had to be birds. Birds had to come into the poems in some form or another. Um, I, I'm an avid bird watcher, so I, I can't really avoid it. I'm going to read things from outside of this book, and there's going to be a lot of birds, as you're going to, as you're going to hear. Um, I also wanted God, in some form or another, to appear in each of the poems, some, some aspect. And then the third thing was they all have to be about anxiety. Good times in this book. I want to stay true to the title, I guess. The Rosetta Stone for Bird Calls. Sometimes I do the thing where I have a title and then I start the poem. Sometimes I do that thing where I have a title and it runs right into the poem. You get to decide. The Rosetta Stone for Bird Calls is the Rosetta Stone for human suffering. Ka equals territorial outrage. Musical flutings upwards equal the days of summer are always declining. Peep equals hunger. Barrage of chirps equals desperate hunger. Who equals the nest has been abandoned. Varied pipings equals I surrender my eggs to a predator. Grates and rusty noises equals the distance between us can only be managed by violence. Trill equals inadequacy of desire. Low whistle equals difficulties with lice, with bacteria, with fungus, etc. No such stone ever hewn would translate lightning or torrent a million years elicits. No such stone would bear the incisions of the master's all. Such a stone would serve instead as instruction manual for building pyramids and museums. When the accipiter in its suicidal plummet snatches the, fitch, snatches the finch, what instrument measures the strum of the vibrating airs? Who sees the god who plucks this lute? <clears throat> Spiritual giants. For starters, cedar wax wings, maneuvering in summer leafage, feathers greased with Vaseline. Also the lark sparrow's buzz, buzzsaw song, a radar. The song sparrow, diminutive, who mounts up sweet, sweet. A glossy ibis, purple pharaoh of salt marshes, black-crowned night heron, master of an elusive attention, extracting alewives from algae with evolutionary tongs. Blue heron, a god arrow, saurian, light practices for moonrise on Saturn, a black bile courses, eases, slenderest tendril a yellow throat leans on, a warrior stave. The new Rilke stumbles later on pebbles of foam littered in the never used party store parking lot, enumerates natural foibles he avoids yet harbors nevertheless. Thinks on birds he's seen, their wing beats like strides, the errors of bird watchers. The angels of Latium fade by daylight, meteor showers, migrations. Nothing he thinks so sweet as some company. Uh, this is a poem called The Revival of the Religious Sciences. The title comes from one of the great uh, Muslim scientists, uh, theologians, and thinkers, Al-Ghazali, who wrote 
this big tract called The Revival of the Religious Sciences. So I was interested that in Islam, religion has this, is understood as a science. You know, it, the thing that intrigued me is especially in terms of the way religion is typically, uh, the, 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 the discourse of religion, particularly in, in kind of popular or, or more sort of widely circulated channels, tends to be very antagonistic towards science or presents itself that way or we're, we're led to believe that there's this you know, dialectical opposition between the two. It seemed really insightful that here's this, you know, here's this, this medieval Muslim thinker who, yeah, the, we're going to revive the religious sciences. Because uh, that's the, there's, the book is in four sections and that's the, the title of this particular section. Um, there are a couple of things in poetry that I, I, uh, I really love. Um, you know, the way that, the way that, a, uh, the way that a child loves sugary cereals, you know. I love lists. I, I love when lists come into poems. I love poets who love to list. It's, and it's, I think one of the most interesting, strangely simple things you can do in poetry, generate a lot of, a lot of power that way. Uh, I also love to make up words. Um, and in the case of this poem, um, I ended up making up a bunch of religious sciences and I gave them all Latin titles. So they would sound, there's no way you could dis dispute the authority of these religious sciences I intend to revive in this poem. So what I'm going to do is read my translations of my Latin. Um, and the Latin is, I mean, it's, it's a total joke. So if any of you has Latin, uh, please forgive me, or mea culpa. I'm just, I'll say it that way. The new sciences, because I'm going to get to them, though you're going to, you'll, you'll uh, find them in the poem here. They are... Uh, Roman tumbling, secrecy of counting, breathing techniques for mass, anxiety of calligraphy, passional ether diving, physics as awe, and the reticent knowledge. The revival of the religious sciences has an epigraph, balsam of souls, the body's bliss. That's Henry Vaughan. No palm branch, no citron, in nobis, sine nobis, the outer, the lower, the dark, extend unevenly beneath the bubble of air, the universe. Boundaries demarcated in light, where the empire curls up like a leaf, going only so far. Even rapidly expanding space goes only so far. A disturbing shock percusses softly on the symbol of atoms, this sad science poetry. Einstein guessed it, a ruse of depth. New speech is discontinuous light, a mirror's broken surface. Blood of two mourning doves glazes the cut plane. A history of breakage is the history of the unconscious, or its genesis spoken into concentric flux. Moments of burial and resurgence spell the texture, abrupt ligatures we dream there. Before too long, I want to revive the religious sciences for the measurement of space, for the demonstration of physical uncertainty. Dionysian icons lurid with heat, vivid terraces of saints seething with entic, entomoan knowledges. Lunar moths, earwigs, queen bees, near translucent ants, a restoration of the prairie grasses as a kind of cosmology. I will call these new sciences Coruro Romanum Enumerum Arcanum Misa Pro Respris Chirographum Metum Passio Urino Etherius Naturum Reverentium Scientia Reluctans. We spent millennia chasing the outward world, hapless experts at exploring it. We need now to look inside. In exchange for any lost progress, I will give you 100 years of inwardness, a century of the soul's spiral movement, labor, prayer, reading, inner energies coalescing from lower domains, a private flaming ministry, the most Miltonic knowledge.
Uh, indigo, cardinal. Um, it refers to two of my favorite birds, the, the cardinal. You've got to love the cardinal in winter. Thank goodness for that little splash of red. And the indigo bunting. Indigo cardinal. Wires tight across the carapace hum from catgut strokes at the bridge that shapes the ancient saltarium. Force that twitches invisible in the instrumental ganglion beneath the seed crusher's hollow bill. This strange and uncanny process of crystallization. Then it is nighttime again and I go down a staircase carpentered with enclosure. I have this one steel-fired sensation holding the nerves of my neck like antlers. Evil's abiding presence. Its polar molecules whining in alignment. Its microscopic flora and fauna. Um, <coughs> this poem is called Steering Goes Watery. When I initially put this, uh, when I initially put the poems in this book together, um, I like, uh, another thing I really like are notes. So there's a lot of notes in the book. There's like, Six pages of notes, and they're ridiculous. But I had included as a note for this particular poem, there's some data in there that's, one of the things is, uh, there's this church in Gloucester, Massachusetts called Our Lady of Good Voyage. And if you've ever been to Gloucester, the front of the church faces, uh, faces the harbor. And, you know, at the, at the, the, apex, of the apex of the facade, um, there's, there's Mary, mother of God, and, and she's cradling this object in her arm, and it's not Jesus, it's a ship. Um, and I first learned about this in the poems of Charles Olson. And Charles Olson, as you're going to hear, shows up in the poem. But when I uh, put the notes together for this, this, uh, this book, I included a note saying, you know, uh, I think it said something like, this really happened. And if... Uh, a friend of mine who, who looked it over, he said, yeah, you should probably get rid of that because, I mean, that should be the case for all of them. You don't necessarily want to make people think, well, this didn't happen, this other poem, what's going on? Steering goes watery. Beyond that barrier, a sucking motion keeps collapsing. Speed falters. The water jacket, iron hot, grills the cylinder till the coolant vaporizes or plumes into the gas tank, reeking of cooked metal. I don't understand it. Drive belts shred like string cheese. All of a sudden, the chassis starts floating. There's a liquidy trickiness to life, an entropy of spillage. I had a breakdown, a breakdown, one of many so far this year. I-90 hummed there for five hours, warts of refineries, bleak, jammed motorway, a killdeer claimed a greasy puddle under the armature. Its namesake call and alarm repeated. By midnight, each minute was an egg deposited from the anus of the queen bee into a waxy hexagon, sealed and remote. Later, Charles Olson stood in a street in Gloucester, a smallish man, neat, trim. He wore a kempt beard, a clean overcoat. I knew him as death and called him father. This made Olson laugh because he knew the poet I thought of as a father was already dead. Soon we are embracing. I am so moved with affection for him, which he returns to me. Above us, our lady of good voyages is drooping light, a weird anxiety and certainty. I want to mention his glutinous pace, but there was none. He could not walk. What strange error of pride in the world made Olson? For all the wreckage out there, a tow truck hopefully comes. That's kind of the, that's the, uh, that's the motto of the book. Hopefully it's coming, okay? Seriously. When the, 
so that did really happen. And when it did, uh, it was the, uh, the engine block in my car cracked. Okay? And when that happens, you're, you, from your exhaust pipe, this unbelievably thick, pluming smoke starts emitting, and it's got this incredibly pungent smell. And we're driving along, and we're just my wife and I were leaving you know, this, this unholy wake that nobody could actually get through. So we pulled over to the side, and I thought, well, if we let, maybe if I let it cool down and start it up again. We'll, was, and we were on the, uh, the Skyway right by Gary. We were stuck near Gary, uh, Indiana. And I, this, I can see this guy's face to this day taunting me at, at, my, at my weakest moment. I'm sitting there, just, I just want to get home. And I turn the car back on, and this, the smoke starts roaring out of the tailpipe again. And this guy is driving by, and he rolls his window down, and he goes, It's your head, gasket! It's your head, gasket! And he just drives on. That was it. Isn't that great? Because that guy had experienced it before, and he wanted me to know. He's like, you're totally going nowhere. This is a poem called Lepra. <clears throat> it starts with a, uh, another epigraph. And this one is from a book called Jesus, a Revolutionary Biography by uh, the controversial um, early Christian, a scholar of early Christianity, uh, John Dominic Crossan. The leprous person is not a social threat because of medical contagion, threatening infection or epidemic, as we might imagine, but because of symbolic contamination, threatening in microcosm the very identity, integrity, and security of society at large. Your rash is theological, a havoc, a ravage, a scath, mephitic alloy, Zymotic Azoth, something alive, thus imperfect. Do you love me, Peter? Agape diluted into philo, so the psyche can apprehend it. Is devotion a blemish? Humors are juice, not excrement, a fluid, affluent part of the body comprehended in it. Unpurged ghosts defidate the rescue of souls by God, by loving women and men. Anthropos and pneumati e catharto. Leprosy is the soul in a cathartic suspension, your skin blistering with lesions. Legion. Separations yellow in daylight. Cicatrization is flesh darning. In loving kindness. I would lick your wounds until they sweetened sufficiently to tolerate interrogation. It's supine in attendances. Do you love me? I'm listening. Your recovery from this damage depends on this question. Let me, let me touch these exulcerations analogous to the thought necrosis of your melancholy. Let me mesh with you into an intersubjective epic of connection, dream. My care is an analeptic lenative, a loving prescription, a list of useful books. Healing is doctoring only in its glorification of the mind embodied. Life, nozo mnemonic to uneasiness, expresses a chylus of dread in the gut, a leucocytic syrup gagged forth in fits or diffused in a gas of mystery. You can only live in a cemetery out of fear of contact, which is need of contact. I don't even need to touch you to cure you. To be clean, take this love a wop at your feet. Touch it, and with it, be touched. I've always found that really fascinating, this notion that leprosy, which is one of the diseases that shows up in the New Testament, it has this modern analog. You know, we think of it as, um, we think of it as leprosy, which is Hansen's disease, which comes from a bacteria. You know, it's, it's totally contagious, and that's why leper colonies were created. But Leprosy, as it appears in, in the New Testament, 
this word lepra had to do with like really bad rashes, really bad skin, skin problems, usually because people weren't clean enough, you know. Like if you don't wash regularly, you're going to get, your skin's going to get kind of nasty. And one of the things about Jewish law uh, was, was you couldn't have, you couldn't be oozing fluid and go into the temple to perform sacrifices. You had to be clean, you know. This is why all the menstrual prescriptions arose, uh, which, you know, you, you just have to read Leviticus, etc., to glory in those. Uh, but it's a kind of interesting thing that it shifted over into the New Testament in terms of the way that Christ, the story of Christ is told, but from these four different writers' perspectives. And each of them is interested in, you know, you can, you can organize Christ's miracles into two, two basic groups. Uh, commensal eating, that is, he would eat with people he wasn't supposed to, or touching, he would touch people he wasn't supposed to, or people would touch him. Uh, so that's the sort of, um, I, that, that seems in itself an interesting way to start thinking about what a miracle is, you know, having to do with receptivity, having to do with, you know, contact, something like that. Um, I'm going to read for you now some selections from this, uh, the poem that I'm working on right now. This is a long poem called The Phosphorescence of Thought. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes the poetry reading can be this thing where the poet reads and everybody, uh, everybody's expected to understand what he's talking about. And, and then the way typically that this is mediated in an event like this is I'm supposed to be uh, kind of ironic and that's supposed to put you at ease in some way. But, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes into writing a poem that some of which I'm aware of and some of which I'm not, but it's kind of ridiculous for me to expect you to have any idea at any point what I'm talking about. Um, so then that puts me in the position of explaining some things and it's hard not to sound kind of pedantic in that situation. So I've been, I've been experimenting with this and I've been trying to, trying to find a kind of middle way, I guess, um, how to explain certain things without going into a lecture and also how to just read things and allow you to uh, hopefully appreciate them for, uh, for what's there. So I'll give you just a couple of little bits of information and I give these to you because, you know, this is my, the, the sort of my investment in this material kind of arises from these things. Um, the title comes from uh, a phrase that appears in the works of the, the Jesuit paleontologist uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Um, that's a kind of strange label, uh, Jesuit paleontologist. He was... Um, he was a controversial figure when he was, uh, shortly after he died. While he was alive, nobody really knew about him because he took his vow of obedience to the Society of Jesus very seriously. And the authorities in the Society of Jesus would not allow him to publish his controversial theological writings. He was, it, his scientific writings were published you know, widely. He wrote a lot of papers. He was famous for discovering the Peking man, which at the time was the oldest complete uh, humanoid skeleton. I think it was 300,000 years old or so. And he spent most of his adult life living in China or uh, the Gobi Desert, often you know, alone or with a few other Mongolian uh, yak herders or something like that. Um, in his book, what, probably his most important book is a thing called the, the Phenomenon of Man. That's usually how it's translated into English, but it could just as easily be the human phenomenon. And he had this idea that as humans were evolving through time, God was also evolving, and that th this coevolution was going to lead toward this omega point. That's the, the name he gave to it, in which he believed at that moment, humans and God would be completely identical. Uh, the whole universe would become Christ. He was, after all, Catholic. <laughs> um, 
But he also was a guy who was, was positing the very first, you know, genuine theories of, of evolution in a Christian theological sense, not feeling that there was an antagonism. So the phosphorescence of thought refers to this little moment in which he imagines a Martian looking at the earth and he says the thing that would be most impressive to a Martian would, would not be the, 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 the blue of its oceans or the green of its trees, but the phosphorescence of its thought. He had this idea that there was this incredible incandescent energy of human thought, this, what he called the, the, the psychosphere, or the, the, would advance into the, the noosphere, that is the sphere of the mind, that it was in, encompassing the earth. And there was this scintillating network of activity just based on human thought and energy. I love that phrase. You know, I, I love the way that, it, I love what it means about the world that we live in. So this poem is about this, well, it's kind of about the mind and it's about, this, about these birds that I see uh, in this place where I do a lot of bird watching, which is on the Des Plaines River, which is a little, uh, kind of nasty little uh, river that's on the western, um, runs through the western suburbs of Chicago. It emerges kind of beautifully and pristinely uh, up in Wisconsin and then is, you know, is sootied in soil as it makes its way eventually to the Mississippi. Um, but as it passes through Chicago, more and more junk is dumped into it, unsurprisingly. And there are two words that kind of center or, or locate the poem. I'm, I'll explain these and then I'll, I'll actually read some things. Um, the words are, uh, they're both words that I made up. The first one is, is lutrescent. I kind of will explain that in the poem as you'll see that I'm just about to read. And lutrescence is, it's, it's the word putrid ma- match with the word, uh, you know, lucid or it's, it's putrescence with something that's lu- lucid. So it's light gone rotten. I feel like that's, that's, what, that's what evolution is. It's, it's, it's light that just keeps, it's like fruit that gets riper and riper and riper. And there's something beautiful and nasty about it. And then the other word is uh, autochthonous. It's kind of a crazy word. So it comes from autochthonous, which is from the Greek self, auto, chthonos for earth. So it's something that comes from the earth. But I wanted to slip in there nomos, which is the Greek for law, so it's, the, it's, it's like the earth's, the law of itself, the earth's own law, which I feel that's what evolution is. You know, that's the earth's law, that's the earth's expression. It's, that's its authority in some way. This is the opening of the poem. The wren, the mind, allows to sing, alights and flits on branches bare of anything other than the sun's ceaseless iodine, the woods at dusk flood with like sutras medita- <clears throat> meditators seep their thoughts in. Neuro- neurochemicals recall from the galaxy's antique axiometry. Alongside the Des Plaines River folding creamy gray through the trees, bubbles with pungent yeasts emplumed in cottony lutrid foam engineered by embankments men pile up to keep the river tame. The mind. The mind assuming reality. The mind's field of forces, its fluid exuberance, re-beginning, leaping up, folding back into terminal unities, endlessly varying. Cluster, synthesis, network, node, centration. The re-entering mental impulse the herring gulls circling, their yellow gapes, little crimson dots, breeding season. The mallards, their rotating strokes around the whirls, dabbling. Those lurid, irisized heads, lutrid, lutrescent. That's the mind's excessive novelty, a tool preposterously ductile language, pulling sound, image, light fluidly together. Freely commandeers to feel reality. To imagine light gone rotten. The wren, again, a house wren, its beak a slightly silvered sickle, its remembered song rapidly rolling, a bubbling liquid trill, an outlandish complexity copied inventively from an adult, a male, not his father. A descending chirruping, a draining descant he variously daylong intones, marking 
the little log he's nesting in, to begin. The woods, the little shabby forest preserve, the swerve of its trashy paths, the partying in its clearings, the little house wren in it, his cinnamon supercilium, the drab pattern of his plumage, and his mate, their clutch of seven pea-sized eggs, luminously speckled, secreted deep in a cavity, excavated down into the fallen log. The red-headed woodpeckers, the flickers, darts defying gravity, their malars, neon slash, the red-bellied picketus, its deeply undulating flight, the avian cocaine I take him for. What evolutionary acquisition does that vibrant red express? It's true, woodpeckers are like cocaine. You see them, it's like, wow. What evolutionary acquisition does that vibrant red express? And what do I love in loving thee? Lumen de lumine, deum vero de deu vero, genitum non factum, consubstantialum naturi, perquem omnia facta sunt. So that, that comes from the credo in the, the Latin mass. It's the uh, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father through whom all things were made. So I swapped out patri, which is Latin for father, with naturi, which is nature. So one in being with nature, through whom all things were made. It's a little blasphemous, a little bit. With the oldest cherubim of knowledge, the fanaphagist cherubs devouring with their bodies the light they transform into scissoring flame, flared forth sword-like and brandished, unspeakably world-like, fully recklessly imagined. We now begin our study of the mind within. Let us use wor the words psychic overtone, suffusion, or fringe. Let us speak in whispers of the one of the meticulous hinge on the book of knowledge hidden in rapt prelusion. Apart. Come. Let us use the word re-entry. Let us sing the differentiating motions whereby thought signals slide and runnels down the mind's great glacial expanse, pooling at the base, lubricating its massive shelves, its agonized calves. Let us use the word epistrophe to mean the turning back of otherwise organized energy to the supra-organized diadem of the Godhead, premeditative acts of prayer, precognitive flights of birds. The warbler, the oriole, the blackbird, the bunting, the sparrow, the water thrush, the warbler, the wren, the wren, the hermit thrush, the warbler, the red start, the yellow throat, the sparrow, the kinglet, the kestrel, the hawk, the wren, the kestrel, the cranes. Another list. I like the lists. <clears throat> the slain wren, the golden crested wren, the hunted wren, the little king, the father's murderer, God's sparrow, the prophetic bird, the ornithological fact, the halcyon myth, the floating nest, the vivid, vivid plumage plunged into the sea, the king of trees, the soul of the oak, the copper, feathered, the copper feathered pheasant, the hornet headed drake, the wind colored snipe, the crimson hooked gull, the awkward young hawk, the azimuth of thrush, the terror glossy crow, the wren in the central place, the starlings and twirling squadrons, the arcanoetic cranes, the fattening hens, the unabashed chickadee, the sepulchral swans, the slaughterous rookery, the autarkic bird lord, the pleromatic fixation, the autistic nucleus, the Canaanite mythology, the silly Celtic lore, the centroverted formation, the ocean of Godhead, the self reentrant pathology, the life spanning midst, the cannibalism, the sorceress who transforms men into animals, the firmamentally liberating act, the inner voice. And I'm going I'm to 
finish with one last list. It's a little bit longer, but oh, so worth it. <clears throat> just a little, bit of, a little bit more context here, just so it's not me reading a, a sort of uh, wildly effusive list. Um, the thing that I'm going to read is based on this uh, medieval Latin hymn called the Benedicite, which um, is, uh, it's, it's, it's basically a praise of creation. You know, uh, Benedicite kind of means uh, sing praises. And, and it lists everything, all creation. It says, you know, all you angels of God, sing the praises of God. Uh, all you rivers and streams, sing the praises of God. All you snows, all you seasons, everything. goes through the list and it uses this really beautiful repetition of the, the word benedicite. And then, um, then the word uh, either benedicat or laudate. It's again, just sing the praises, say good things about these. Um, and uh, I became really interested in this when I watched uh, a couple of, I guess maybe it was a year ago, a little bit longer ago than that, a year and a half ago, the film Integrate Silence by uh, Philip Gruning. He's a German filmmaker, and he, he had five years or so in which he had this kind of exclusive access to this Carthusian monastery in the French Alps, and he just recorded these monks, you know, doing their things like gardening and picking up stuff, feeding cats and praying, and they take vows of silence so they don't, they, they, the only time they vocalize is when they're, they're praying together six times a day. And then one day a year, or a few days a year, they get to go out and kind of frolic in the fields together, and they talk. And he captured this particular day. Uh, and I mention this because it shows up at the end of this part of the poem I'm going to read. Because these monks, they have this one day when they can go out and, you know, shoot the shit. And what they talked about is there's this towel that was in front of this door and it had been moved. And they, just, they, and they had this intense theological discussion about that towel. Like, and, you know, one of them says, if we, if we re- change the symbols, we destroy our house. You know, it's like that's, that's their chat, that's their small talk on their day off. Um, the, there's a version of the Benedicite in the Book of Common Prayer, uh, the Anglican prayer book. I'll just read you the first two lines of it so you get a sense of it. O all ye works of the Lord, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him forever. O ye angels of the Lord, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him forever. So you get a sense of the repetitions. I wanted to figure out how I could bring that into my poem and how I could do it without relying overly on liturgical language because liturgical language is vivid in the context of liturgy, and it is static outside of that context, I've found, because I've tried to tr- bring it into poetry. You can't, it can't be done. You've got to be in the moment of the liturgy for it to work. So you've got to come up with something else to hold the energy of you know, the liturgical power. And it took me a little, bit of, a little while, but uh, in consultation with a good friend of mine, I realized I could, I could simply repeat the word you, as you'll see. And that's going to be the kind of anchor to all this. And what I wanted to do was take the Benedicite, which is maybe 20, 25 lines long or so, but I wanted to include everything that I could into it, the whole, all of creation, all, the whole history from the Big Bang up to right now, if possible, and in, you know, three pages. So that's, that's where we're at. I'm going to have to, I have to lubricate a little here. <clears throat> I feel my voice going. Make holy all you works of God with praise and exultation. You angels of God and you heavens, you magnifiers of all the single quantum's original energy. You primordial billion of years, depthless night, shuddered toward trans- transfiguration through. You praise, you magnification. You unbearable creative moment, you consuming sacrificial force. 
make holy, you galactic internal dynamics, you spew of stars, you luminous intensities, you waters coursing over heaven, and you dynamos generating their power, you slow burning yellow star, you socket of life, you sun and moon, you same sized Argentine luminaries drifting in the skies, you fungal spores into the sinuses huffed, you wicked lunar eclipse, you dais of cooling light years. Make holy this song by blessing, by building up with praises, you telescope of time, you notion of creation, you most antique ledge of energy it peers toward, you aeonic disdain, you horror torus, you flowing forms, you atmospheric womb, you cellular chemistries, you earthly life, you showers and dew, you souls, you tenderly dusted glimmering mineral energy wound, you little animations of things, you prokaryotic cells, you knitters together, you fashioners of life. Make holy this song by filling your chemical bellies with food from the sun, by binding packets of bright particles sped down to the brooding earth with data of the life mass, and make holy you fires, you head, you winters, you hot summers, you dews and dendritic frosts, you icy rhymes and you polar colds, and you praisers and exalters, you oxygen saturating earth system, you environmental instability, you cosmic burning aspect, you fire starters, you setters ablaze of things, you oxygen devouring eukaryotic cells, you sweet fuckers, you meiotic gametic procreant urge, you involuntary erections and you sexual daytime, you avid winter ice and you fluffy winter snows, you days and nights passing through them, you light, you gloomy darkness, you bottom down sadness sadder still, you exfulgurations and you clouds, you rapid hapless scattering of electricity, Make holy this song, you multicellular forms, you bodies, you polyps, you worms, you insects, you clams, you sponges, you spiders, you leeches, you backbones, you life forms, surging, metabolizing, expiring, you corpses, you spent energy, you unspooling tendrils of mushroom protein, you anuses extruding that vitalizing hash, you necrophagous moonlight fruits, you eaters of your own dead and you living things, you caloric scavengers and you sex scroungers. Make holy this song, you fountains gushing up and you seas and flumes, you rivers flowing, you sad sewage foaming and you amylaceous wastes curdling, you tanny yeasty, you tannic yeasty odors and you passerines migrating through the leaves oxygenating the reek. You hydrodynamic pluvious dust plains, you lather at the turban falls, you guggled twitching spent alongside, you make holy this song, you mammals, you new emotional sensations, you intoxicated central nervous system, you flowers displaying and you pollinators, you songbirds in sexual colors and you flesh of fruit, and you mother and baby sensing the quality of these things and remembering it. You elephantine massive whales and whatever else in the waters moveth. You birds of the sky threading the air with flight. You innovation of flying. You lumbering beasts of the land. You cattle sweet as grass. And you handsome cougars slain in the neighborhood. Uh, bracket that last year this cougar showed up in Chicago. And uh, everybody freaked out. And the, it got cornered by the cops and it was slain. They showed pictures of it uh, in the newspaper the next day, and it was the most gorgeous animal. It was like 300-pound cougar that just came into Chicago following the river, got into the neighborhoods. It's just amazing. Um, of course, you know, I, they, had, they had to kill it. I, I think it was probably too crazy otherwise, but it seems like they could have tried to capture it. I don't know. And you handsome cougars slain in the neighborhood. I wanted to get him in the poem. And you little house cat sphinxes perplexing the sun, you peoples, you daughters and you sons, make holy this song, you quadrupedal hand fee freed from the task of walking, you eye seeing it flex, you sweet liquor of rain, you sweet liquor of light and rain falling down, you mind imagining this, you sweet interiors, by magnifying the moment, by corroding the pathways that internal vision followed, by decaying the mind, toward morbid presciences, imagination fecundates. 
Make holy this song, you trillions of neurons keeping the creature, you stellar vistas of cells, you epiphenomenal loop, you initial leap from action to reflection, from pathway to memory, you self-thought, you slot of distinction, you crashed acid and phosphorescent flare, you infancy, you chance to learn, you curious sexual forms, you phallic thumb of love, and you thruster holding me tight. You pressure in the uterine clutch, you glare of the rich palpation, you proposition of sperm, you orchid boat, and you winged serpent, you sweet sleepiness, you relaxed body, you nations of the world, you language coming in, and you priests serving God, you spirits, you souls, you depths, you justice, you holiness, you humble heart. Make holy this song, you eccentrations of life, you lutrescent syrup in the veins, you autochthonous animal forms, shifting pneumatic imaginal shape, by numerously erupting with fire, by impulsively giving birth, by catastrophically sanctifying the metaphors, by interpenetrating the coital cluster, by singing out love's ancient evidence, by haplessly magnifying the glassy melancholic interiors, by warding us with charms, by stitching us alphabetic talismans from strands of DNA, by forming tissue from moon spores and rubber, by leading us on, by thinking, by praising and exalting the Lord forever. If you abolish the symbols, then you tear down the walls of your own house. You should unfold the core of the symbols. We are the questions. So praise Ananias Azarias, Misael, bless the Lord, praise and exalt him forever. Thank you very much.